Well, we're here continuing a series we started a couple of weeks ago in these high point distinctives. And we've been taking a look at the acronym TULIP, which is known as the five points of Calvinism, or we've also heard those appropriately called the doctrines of grace. And it's helpful to refer to these as the doctrines of grace because we know that these are doctrines that have been taught in Christ's church because they're taught in scripture well before John Calvin. These are not original ideas to John Calvin by any means. But regardless, as we've been working through this series, we began when tulips were actually in bloom, and so it seemed like it was an appropriate time to do that. It was nice outside, and we had been sheltering in place after a long winter, and well, now here we are just a couple of weeks later, and things are already starting to die. And I was thinking about this. It's such an interesting phenomenon because the last two summers here in northeastern Pennsylvania have been so unusually wet. It rained almost every day, it seemed like, just two summers ago. But now here we are. And one spring that's a little bit dry and that's all it takes for plants to begin to wither and die. Well, so it is with the church. The evangelical church in America has been fed truth and sound doctrine for a long time. It comes from the sound heritage of Christ's church that has been passed for the last 2,000 years and that has been recovered in the proclamation of the gospel in the Reformation. We have a strong heritage, firm roots. We have been nourished by the word of God. But it didn't take very long in evangelicalism because of a deficiency, a lack of nourishment in the Word of God that evangelicalism is beginning to dry up. And we're beginning to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. And that compels us for us to renew our dependency on the Word of God and look to it for our its authority. And there is perhaps no more important place than to begin with the gospel message itself that is supported by these doctrines of grace. So today we're looking at the doctrine of irresistible grace, the I in the acronym TULIP. And of course, we know from the doctrines that we've already had looked at, that this is just the next natural thing. Total depravity demands it. Unconditional election demands it. Limited atonement demands God's irresistible grace. What is his irresistible grace? Well, God gives his Holy Spirit in such a way to give grace to the unregenerate sinner so that they receive, repent, and believe the gospel of God. But that is a special grace. It is an effectual grace, a grace that is irresistible. It's a special kind of grace that is only given to God's elect whom he has foreordained to receive his gospel by grace before the foundations of the world. Now, if we look at a number of passages of, uh, passages of scripture, again, we can see why this is so necessary. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Romans chapter 6, verse 20, we are slaves to sin. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 to 8, our hearts and minds are corrupt. And uh, Jesus also teaches in, in Matthew chapter 7 that we are unable to repent and receive his gospel. In fact, what he says in Matthew chapter 7 is that a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Well, if repenting and believing the gospel isn't the first fruit of having received salvation, then I don't know what kind of fruit we have at all. And so if we're inherently a bad fruit, how can we then believe? Well, again, that's why the grace of God, the special grace of God that gives us new life, regenerates us in Christ is, is so necessary, that breaks the bondage of sin our enslavement to sin and instead makes us slaves of righteousness. It gives us a new heart and a new mind in Christ. It gives us the ability, because we have been regenerated by God's grace, 
to repent and believe his gospel. Now, oftentimes, we are initially repulsed by this doctrine because we have turned grace upside down. We, we have gone from recognizing grace for what it is, the grace of God being a gift of faith that is undeserved to something we actually deserve and demand. God's grace is no longer grace. God's grace and the lack of it, the lack of God giving grace is an injustice. And like I said, so we've turned grace completely on its head. If God doesn't give his grace unto salvation to all universally, God is all of a sudden unjust. When we had forgotten that because we are dead in our trespasses and sins, we are inherently guilty of being trespassers of God's law. And the only thing that is just is for God to condemn us for our sins. He doesn't need to give us his grace, but that's just what we have done. And denying the doctrine of irresistible grace, we demand that God must give his grace. But John Calvin and his Institutes for the Christian Religion argues that we shouldn't be baffled or bewildered by this irresistible grace that God provides to his elect. Because first of all, none of us are deserving of it. None of us are worthy of it. And we also know that there are those who've rejected his grace. God, in a sense, universally calls all to repent and believe his gospel though none are able, apart from his grace. And as believers, we naturally understand the necessity of God's irresistible grace, and that is why we pray that God would save maybe loved ones or, or others that whom we've met that don't know God and his gospel. We'll pray that God would, would save those individuals. What we're praying for is that God would intervene in their life in a special way to grant salvation in a way that he otherwise wouldn't have done. We know that God has to work a special, effectual kind of grace in the lives of unbelievers. And that's why Paul in Romans chapter 9, I think it's in verse 18, it might be verse 19, don't quote me on it, but, but Paul anticipates what has become the evangelical objection to the doctrine of irresistible grace. And he says, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? And Paul then goes on to argue that God is indeed just. Because who are we as man to answer back to God? God justly shows mercy to whom he'll show mercy and compassion to whom he will show compassion. God's irresistible grace is so necessary because none of us deserve it. And we are all dead in our trespasses and sins. Being dead in our trespasses and sins, how can any of us respond to anything? We're dead. So God has to breathe in us new life. That's his grace to receive his gospel.